Howdy, guys. Um, very good. Thanks for having me here today. It's a very big spread out crowd, so I'm going to have to sort of do a bit, of, a lot of eye contact left and right across the room. But um, uh, thanks for having me today to talk about innovation in, uh, in certainly the workplace, but certainly innovation more broadly as well too. Uh, a lot of people get stuck with it, so hopefully I'll uh, give you a few pointers which you can walk away with and use in your, uh, your own organisations. Um, now, this is a slightly interactive uh, session as well too, so we'll be using a tool called Slido. Um, so there is a Slido app you can download, otherwise you can also uh, log on to slido.com, as you can see on your screens there, and enter the code G147, which is the code for this event. Uh, what that's going to allow us to do is, when you see the said big symbol there, uh, there'll be some, some um, questions I'll be asking of you so we can sort of poll the audience as we go. It gives me a bit of a feel as to uh, how you guys are doing and what you're doing within your organisations. It also gives us the chance for you to ask questions. So you can ask a question at any time. And I'm going to save those questions to the end where we'll work through them. You'll also find on the questions uh, screen that you can upvote questions. So if you like a question, the more likes a, a question gets, depending on how many questions uh, uh, we get towards the end, will determine on will determine uh, uh, which ones we, we answer or not. So Slido. Uh, a little bit about me. Sorry, I'm tr trying not to move around. I generally like to move around. I don't have sort of sticky feet, but um, I'm, a, I guess, what you'd call an early pioneer. It's like, when do you actually become a pioneer? Is that a self-elected title or, or whichever? But I've been around a while in the, uh, the ed tech market. I lead the team uh, at eCreators. Um, I, I'm a, a bit of a curious person by nature, so uh, you'll find me all over the place. I sometimes speak at different events, uh, I'll be speaking in different forums, I'll be constantly learning uh, from, from other people. Um, and I'm the, essentially the innovation master uh, at eCreators, so I come up with a lot of the ideas. And saying that, uh, innovation does come from all parts of our organisation, so uh, everybody uh, at eCreators, and I think everybody in every organisation should be partly responsible for uh, innovation. Uh, I'm also a bit of a barbecue guy. Um, I have five barbecues. Um, my wife tells me that's four too many, um, but I do love cooking stuff. I do vegetarian, I do uh, meats, all sorts of things, but um, it's one of my, one of my passions. And of course, I'm a lifelong learner as well too. So um, our tagline uh, for eCreators is love the way you learn. And I'm a big believer in that, that uh, the way you learn should be a, a very enjoyable experience, uh, be it online, offline or, or otherwise. Uh, you've probably seen a bit of, bit of us over the last couple of days with eCreator on our, our social networks and our social mediums and the like. Uh, but we are a sort of certified Moodle partner. It's coming up to seven years since we've been uh, working together with Moodle on... Uh, working towards uh, creating better products with them. Uh, we've certainly been a big contributor to the project over the years as well. Um, big year for us this year. We also have a number of other organisations that we, we do partner with. We work across essentially all verticals. Uh, we're strong in government, we're strong in uh, uh, retail, in corporate. Um, you know, we believe that a learning management system has a place inside every organisation. Uh, but we're also very big and very conscious of utilisation of those systems within organisations too. We don't want the LMS to be this place where people come along, do a course, go away and, and perhaps don't come back for 12 months. Uh, we want to make sure that the utilisation is much heavier. Uh, again, speaking of clients, we work across uh, a wide cross-section of clients. So we have defence, we have policing, we have uh, NGOs, we're very big in the not-for-profit space. Uh, we work with uh, a lot of social purpose organisations. Some of the organisations we work with, we work with pro bono as well. So in the past, we've worked with organisations like uh, Lord uh, Summers uh, uh, Camp there, uh, White Ribbon, uh, have been a, a long-standing client who certainly started as a pro bono client. Uh, and the Centre for Social Purpose as well is a more recent uh, pro bono client as well too. We think it's a very important part of uh, any organisation's uh, being uh, to give back. Um, when, when you think of eCreators, and certainly uh, the, the image we want to sort of project for ourselves is that we are what we call a, a full stack ed tech organisation. So uh, we work in content, we work in platform, we work in uh, software development, e-commerce. Um, you know, our, our offices are open to our clients. So if you're an eCreators client, for example, you can come down and use our studio uh, services for free. We've got green screens and cameras, both still and video. We've got AR, VR equipment you can use and uh, borrow back into your organisation. And we also have our own uh, innovation and funding uh, mechanisms as well too. So 
we, we hate to see organisations that have these wonderful ideas come to us, uh, we come back to them with a quote maybe, and they don't have the budget to achieve what they're trying to do. So quite often when we find these interesting ideas, we'll assist those organisations with funding them as well too. So sometimes it's partial funding, sometimes it's just resourcing, uh, sometimes it's otherwise. So uh, we really do provide that end-to-end -end, uh, solution for all of our clients. Okay, so first test on our survey till now. Uh, I want to find out a little bit more about you. So. How many of you currently are using design thinking in your organisation? So just give me a yes or a no. Here they come. How great's this tool? It's really good. And it's good to be able to talk to the, uh, the audience along the way. Okay, yeah, so 50%, great. A few unsures, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, sometimes you can actually be using design thinking without actually knowing that you're using design thinking. Okay, that's a pretty good cross-section, 51 responses so far, they keep coming through. It's always interesting with this tool when you get to the question stage as well too. A lot of people put in their name as like Conan the Barbarian and you know. Um. Okay, great, that gives me a pretty good feel. So 59 responses there, the majority are saying yes uh, within their organisations. Ooh, dropping back a bit now, some a bit slower than others to get on. Now you've got it though, uh, that'll come up. We'll be coming back to some of this data later in the Prezo as well. That gives me a good feel. Okay, so uh, I think Jocelyn actually touched on this in the, in the previous session, but uh, talking about uh, our tribes and our tribe mentality. Um, and it's funny because, you know, uh, the original tribes never travelled more than about five kilometres away from each other. And indeed, there's still some tribes that don't uh, in the world. They're fewer and fewer, um, but they have everything they need. They have water, they have shelter, they have food, you know, they, those basic things. Uh, they make their own tools, the tools they need to... Uh, uh, survive in their, in their communities as well and to some extent uh, we are still tribes of certain natures even these little tables I guess little tribes you know each other you're comfortable with each other, with each other. you may have stepped into another tribe today if you, if you don't know each other um, but they take uh, all different shapes and, and sizes Facebook you can think of as a, as a giant tribe with lots of little tribes inside it um, again, when I, I speak about utilisation, as I did before, uh, you know, um, we're all about uh, making the LMS a place where these tribes can communicate, can find information off each other, uh, find things that are meaningful um, towards their learning inside our environments. We're in uh, an unprecedented uh, period of technology innovation. Um, things are happening faster and faster and faster than they ever have before. You know, we've got uh, blockchain, we've got cryptocurrency, we've got AI, we've got machine learning. Uh, and these uh, designs, if you like, are evolving quicker and quicker and quicker. More people have more access to more information. Uh, more people can do things on a grander scale. Uh, you can certainly access audiences far quicker than you ever have before. So um, things can grow and things can happen really, really rapidly. Uh, and you see by that chart there that, you know, since 1950, you know, things used to sort of plot along and we had our mainframes and the like, uh, and now we're heading towards things like quantum computing, uh, where we can uh, do things so much quicker. So those weights for your airport tickets and the weights at the bank are uh, slowly diminishing as our technology gets quicker and faster and better, better for the most part. Um, I recently had the, uh, the pleasure of spending um, some time in, in Silicon Valley and uh, part of what I wanted to do over there was to visit a lot of different organisations doing different things. And I think a, an important part of uh, uh, being an innovator or being in the innovative space is that you really have to spend time outside your own circles. So if you're trying to innovate in education, for example, don't spend all your time in innovation. You'll find if you uh, go to a car manufacturer uh, and see the latest things that they're doing in the car industry, there's things that you'll take away. Um, so it's really important to sort of spread your horizons and open up your mind to what other inter industries are doing. Um, we visited uh, quite a few organisations over there and got to spend time, direct time with executive vice presidents, executive general managers uh, from most of these organisations to talk to them about, you know, the future of their products and the, the, the future of uh, uh, the products and the touch they have on, on humanity uh, across their various industries. 
And look, it was really, really different uh, across different places. So at, at Google one day, for example, you know, they're inducting you know, 300 people at once and they get their little Google hat with a little propeller on it and uh, all the rest. Uh, eBay, we uh, went and saw uh, several pitch fests where they're pitching new products and eBay gives people a platform for uh, people to be able to do that, sort of like a little shark tank uh, type scenario. Uh, obviously, Uber um, are doing uh, some pretty incredible things out there uh, in the world and you know, have their own uh, competition and uh, barriers to get over as well. Um, Berkeley Skydeck, a really interesting place. So Berkeley Skydeck is a, a Berkeley run a, uh, an innovation fund, if you like, that you can access uh, every year. Anybody's welcome to apply. Um, and they give you a space and funding and incredible depth of resources from... Uh, from, uh, from Berkeley University uh, to be able to achieve those ideas. So talent you wouldn't necessarily get access to is made available to you um, from a very small seed right up to Angel and, and Series A. Um, so really interesting things. At the other end of that is a little company called Coding Dojo. Um, so you've probably heard more and more these days about you know, uh, university degrees not necessarily being the, the key ticket or entry point to, uh, be able to be being able to work within an organisation. But uh, Coding Dojo runs a 16-week intensive uh, program on stacks. So the iOS stack or the Linux stack, whatever stack you're sort of uh, looking to get into, and Apple and Microsoft and Google, all the top 10 are just reaching for these guys and grabbing them because they come out with the, the job-ready skills that they need to start uh, boots on the ground developing straight away. Um, you know, it's an amazing place, Silicon Valley, but there's also you know, the dark side of Silicon Valley as well too that you see. So uh, there's parts of San Jose, for example, that you drive through and there's literally hundreds of motorhomes. And I don't exaggerate when I say hundreds, I mean hundreds just lining the streets where, um, think of it like the Hollywood of, of, uh, of ed tech or of, of technology in general. You know, people go there with the stars in their eyes, their big dreams, uh, and it doesn't work out for them. So they're stuck um, living in these motorhomes. Sometimes it's just, you know, four guys like your Silicon Valley TV show. Other times it's uh, entire families that live in these motorhomes and are just working off the gig economy. So working off Airtasker and uh, Fiverr and all these sorts of places to, to make ends meet until they get that, that big job. You know, it's, um, it's not unusual for full stack developers in Silicon Valley to earn, you know, three or $400,000 a year. So there's some, um, some big, big opportunities out there, uh, the, the rock star side of the valley. Um, one of the interesting places we went to was NASA. Um, this was the front gate of NASA and the, the group I went with was uh, 15 CEOs uh, from all different countries. So from Russia, from the States, from Australia, from New Zealand, South Africa, all over the place. And we got there and we weren't on the list. Um, so the security guy's going, you're not on the list. And with all of a sudden, within five or six minutes, there were five and six police cars that had sort of jumped out, the NASA police, and um, gave us the full uh, working over and, you know, where's your passport and, uh, and all the rest. So it was a bit of a scary moment. You know, 15 foreigners stuck on a bus uh, at the front gate of Ames Research Centre and, um, you know, were we allowed to be there? I was very quick. I got my pass out. I had my pass. I was ready to go. Um, and we had some great conversations with some of the uh, NASA engineers over there. And, I mean, these are some of the problems they're trying to figure out. So we think our problems are big. Um, they're trying to figure out, you know, uh, what do we do to divert an asteroid and can we find a, a second Earth? Um, how is the universe forming? Uh, is there, was there life on Mars? Can we colonise Mars? So. Um, these are, you know, problems at a, a, a grand scale uh, that these guys are uh, enveloped in uh, on an ongoing basis. So, you know, really interesting. Uh, there was a, a fact they dropped. I think was I think the planet's called uh, Alpha Centauri, which is our closest Earth-like type uh, planet, which um, at our top velocity of about 56,000 kilometres per hour, I think it was, uh, would take us 86,000 years to get there. So that's quite a journey. Um, so that one's probably not going to happen within our, our lifetime, but you never know. Um, you probably all heard, you know, obviously a lot about Uber. Um, everybody here uses Uber, yeah? Yeah. Um, have you heard about their flying vehicles? Yeah. Yep. Lots happening there. So um, Melbourne has actually just been selected as one of the test grounds for the new Uber flying machine. So by 2022, we're going to have these things in the air around Melbourne. Um, it was great talking to them about, you know, the, the, the future of what's happening at Uber 2 and having uh, places like rooftops be the new real estate. 
So they need to land these things somewhere um, to, to sort of connect the human journey. So if I'm uh, at home, for example, I can call an Uber, the car arrives, it takes me to the nearest building where I can go to the top, get a landing pad, um, go to my next destination where another car will, be, car will be waiting for me and I complete my journey. So you can imagine some of the logistical nightmares and logistical issues that, that come along with that. Um, so for those of you that haven't uh, seen, I just want to show you this little video. So there you go, Uber and, and their customer journey. Um, it was interesting, actually, I was in an Uber the other day out on the way out to the airport, and um, I said to the guy uh, driving the Uber, I said, so what do you think they're going to do? Actually, I'll, I'll give you a, share another part of that story. Um, he uh, registers as an Uber driver and says that he lives near the airport, um, so when he logs off and says he's going home, he can get a whole fare all the way to where he is, so another a little innovator. Um, but I said, what about the noise? You know, what about the noise? We're going to have Amazon drones up there soon delivering food and parcels. And then all of a sudden there's going to be these big manned aircraft, eventually unmanned. So Uber are thinking around 2030 uh, that there'll be unmanned vehicles. So what about that noise? And his answer to me was one I hadn't really considered. It's, um, uh, he, he was this older guy. He sort of said, well, you know... Uh, in my day, first of all, it was horses. We all thought they were going to be too noisy. It sounded like Mel Brooks for some reason, I don't know. Um, and then it was cars. We thought all the cars and all the trucks and all the traffic will be too noisy. Uh, so there'll be less cars and trucks and things on the road uh, and more noise in the, in, the, in the sky. So it's just new noise, new noise. Okay, fair enough. That's a different way to look at it. So what are some of the issues that they're facing, Uber, now? Where to land? So where are the ideal places to have these vehicles? Uh, obviously, noise is a big one. Another one which came up in our little meeting was puber. Um, what happens if someone can't make it to the bathroom after a big night at the nightclub and you get that Uber? Um, that's not great. That's not a great thing to have. So how do you handle these basic human dynamics that are out there uh, that change the way we travel? So they've got some big uh, issues and obviously regulations through you know, federal aircraft authorities and the like as well too that they need to face. Uh, so we'll be seeing uh, a lot more of that in the press. So by 2022, they'll be flying in Melbourne is the plan. Uh, and uh, towards 2030, uh, looking at um, uh, automated machines, which is scary again on its own. So new products. Um, there's a little thing called the emotional journey of creating new products. Uh, for any of you that might follow me on LinkedIn, there's a couple of you, I think, three. Um, uh, this is one of the things that we often have when we're creating something new. I'm going to try... Can you hear me okay without the microphone? Yep. No? Okay. No, we're recording as well, so we do need the microphone. Okay, great. All right. I'll have to put my hand up like this. I need a pointer. So let's start on the left there. Um, how many times have you been at it, sort of like a, a, a barbecue or whichever, and you have the best idea ever? Um, you hear a lot of these conversations. A lot of the time they sort of end there. I'll go back to the polls for a second. I want to ask another little question. So 
back onto your uh, app there. I want to see if anybody's actually on uh, this emotional journey of creating something great um, and where you sort of might, uh, might be there. So there's the best idea ever, which is uh, right at the top here. There's the sea of despair where you might be a bit stuck or bogged down or you might be um, towards that stage where, hmm, we could be onto something here. You know, this, this could actually work out. So are you here? I'll give you a couple of seconds to get those stats in. The sea of despair, the dreaded sea of despair. Most products go through this. Okay, great. So some of you guys are on to... Um, that wonderful place where we could be onto something here and it's a great place to be. Uh, we see a lot of it uh, when we create products ourselves at eCreators and certainly when our clients are doing the same things and, and creating new things because a lot of us start off at that, this is the best idea ever. They get down to that stage where they go, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, we're actually going to do this. You know, we've got that early stage plan. Um, then they get to the stage where they go, oh, this is harder than we thought. We don't have maybe the ideas or the IP or the people within our organisation to, uh, to make this a, a realised dream, if you like. So what do we sort of do next? Um, then you actually discover that this thing is going to be a lot of hard work. You know, uh, there's not many ideas that uh, happen in the world where people come and go, oh yeah, had this idea, got a production team together, did some market research, no problem. I'm now living in Tahiti and having a great old time. You don't hear many stories like that. Uh, at the same time, you don't hear a, a great deal of stories too about the dark swamp of despair and how people fall into there. There's a lot of broken dreams and broken products that live in that dark uh, swamp of despair. It doesn't necessarily need uh, to be the case though. Uh, this is why we have that persistence uh, a bridge there, if you like, the bridge of persistence. And I think Gree spoke a bit about it uh, yesterday as well too about iterative design. I'm going to start talking more about that. Um, so once you cross that, uh, that bridge, you sort of get to that okay stage. You know, things are going okay. We, we, we could you know, still make something of this. And then we sort of get that hmm moment. Yeah, we're, we're actually onto something here. You know, we're starting to see designs. We're starting to see prototypes at this stage. We're starting to see that this thing could actually be a success. And then we go, hey, this is great. By this stage, we've got customers perhaps using our products. We've got user development teams giving us feedback on our products filling in a few of those gaps, and then we get up to that wow factor. And that wow factor is that uh, time where you actually make the product, it goes into production, you make that change, and people start using it. And that's a, that's a pretty good feeling. That's a pretty good feeling and a pretty good place to be. Um, but how do we get there? Um, a little saying here uh, that, that many unproductive ideas uh, uh, fall into this slot and people say fail fast. These days though we're talking about learning fast. So by learning faster obviously whenever we have that great idea it doesn't work we go back into that iterative design and we try again. We've learnt the lessons of the previous mistakes so we're moving forward again and again and again uh, to try and get that, uh, that product right. But even the big guys fail. So uh, I was at the Amazon uh, conference the other day, uh, Amazon Web Services up in Sydney and uh, the AWS Summit had uh, a, a big uh, sort of part of their presentation on this and talking about, you know, how the big guys fail and, and they do, you know, uh, we see all the shiny end result uh, of, uh, of their great products and how, they, how those products are used across the world. But what we don't see is all the broken bits in that sea of despair. Um, this is a little video they played there, which I wanted to sort of share with you too. That's a reheat pasta. Reheating pasta. It's cool, right? Yeah, I didn't know you guys put Alexa in the microwave. Yeah, we're putting her in a lot of stuff now. But trust me, there are a lot of fails. Like, like what? Like... Alexa, play my podcast. When you heard that, did that surprise you? Barb seems exciting. We need an Alexa dog collar for dogs. Ordering dog food. Ordering dog food. You can bark all you want. I'm not paying for any more dog food. Ordering gravy. 
Ordering sausages. Hey, you better cancel that order. That's a hot tub. I sucked. Let's not play music. Okay. And then there was the incident. Wait, that, that was you guys. I don't know, was it? <laughs> She Power says down. she's doing it, but I don't see anything to you. Holy. I'm not talking to you. Yeah, so it's okay. It's okay to fail or not hit the mark on the first time. Um, sometimes it takes several times and again it's great to see that the big guys with all their resources and skills and knowledge and professors and tools and equipment and unlimited resources uh, also go through the same. Okay. Okay, so I just want to touch on some recent innovations and I won't get too uh, into these. This is generally a, a session I'd run over an entire day, so um, I don't want to sort of uh, get too deep in, but I do want to touch on some of the uh, newer things that are out there like machine learning and AI. Um, you know, we're seeing so much more um, uh, machine learning out there, so, and the machines are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And obviously there's the AI camp, there's the machine learning camp, which I think machine learning lends a lot from AI, but one of those things is uh, the self-driving vehicles and how fast they're learning. So they're learning to not just um, be the dumb drone to go left and right and follow a map, but to actually identify obstacles, which is pretty incredible. So they can tell what a human is, what a dog is, um, what a 50 sign looks like. To the extent now that uh, machine learning is allowed to uh, vehicles to drive somewhat better than humans, uh, they can predict things that are going to come up, they can avoid uh, obstacles more efficiently, and they're certainly not distracted by things. Uh, they're able to, to make a, a lot of their own uh, decisions when it comes to driver safety. So obviously we hear about, you know, um, uh, uh, vehicles and self-driving vehicles having single accidents, and they can sort of compare that towards, you know, how many accidents human has. And obviously humans have this many and uh, machines have, you know, very, very few. Um, I think a lot of that, though, is uh, who do you blame when a machine has an accident? You know, is it the software manufacturer's fault? Is it the, the vehicle's fault? Is it the car manufacturer's fault? So again, we're still working out a lot of how these things will integrate into our societies. Uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, uh, fall into a similar camp. So, you know, uh, stats out of the US these days are saying that uh, a lot of the, uh, the new generation, uh, about 30% of them are now, now have some form of cryptocurrency, a small firm form of cryptocurrency. Um, Facebook the other day just released uh, Project Libra, uh, which allows for cryptocurrency transactions to take place on, on its platform. There's also, uh, remember the big argument between the, the twins uh, who owned Facebook and Facebook themselves? Um, the twins have actually come out with Project Gemini at exactly the same time. So it's like they're, they're after each other again. You know, you were first to social media, we're gonna do crypto. Uh, but Facebook had popped up out of the, uh, the spectrum again and uh, uh, got involved there. And then blockchain technology is going to see uh, things change uh, uh, again. Robotics and automation uh, are certainly a, a big one too. Um, you know, th things are happening behind the scenes these days that we're just not aware of. There's uh, robotics and automation happening in, uh, in ag, ag care, certainly in, in health tech. You know, uh, uh, we went to the Singularity University, which is based within NASA, and you know, they were showing us some of the tools that have been drawn from Star Trek and all the rest. So they've got you know, medical tricorders now which can uh, scan your heart rate without touching you and um, feel your body temperature, do all these wonderful things. Um, Amazon was another area, and both Amazon and Alibaba are having this battle, not just in the cloud hosting space, but certainly in the distribution space, how they can make distribution more uh, uh, effective. I wanted to show you uh, another little clip on uh, one of their Only warehouses. Ranking of things to worry about, Skynet coming and taking over doesn't even rank in the top ten. It distracts attention from the more urgent things, like for example, what's going to happen to jobs. For a glimpse into the future, consider one of the largest companies on the planet. 
Amazon. Amazon has tremendous scale. We have fulfillment centers that are as large as 1.25 million square feet. That's like 23 football fields. And in it, we'll have just millions of products. To deal with that scale, Amazon has built an army of robots. Like a marching army of ants that can constantly change its goals based on the situation at hand, right? So our robots are very adaptive and reactive in order to extend human capability to allow for more efficiencies within our own buildings. And there's plenty more where those came from. Every day, this facility in Boston graduates a new batch of machines. All of the robots that you see that are moving the pods have been built right here in Boston. I call it the nursery, where uh, the robots are born. They'll be built, they'll take their first breath of air, they'll do their own diagnostics. Once they're good, then they'll line up for robot graduation, and then they will swing their tassels to the uh, appropriate side, drive themselves right onto a pallet, and go directly to a fulfillment center. To some of us, this moment belies a dark sign of what's to come, a future that doesn't need us, one where all jobs, not just cab drivers and truckers, are taken by machines. But Amazon's chief roboticist doesn't see it that way. The fact is really plain and simple. The more robots we add to our fulfillment centers, the more jobs we're creating. The robots do not build themselves. Humans design them, humans build them, Humans deploy them, humans support them, and then humans, most importantly, interact with the robots. When you look at that, this enables growth, and growth does enable jobs. Certainly, history would seem to bear him out. Since the Industrial Revolution, new technologies, while displacing some jobs, have created new ones. While this is the predominant view in the AI community, some think it ignores the reality of today's world. There's a long history of technology creators assuming that only good things would happen with their baby when it went out into the world. Even if there are some new jobs created somewhere, the vast majority of people are not easily going to be able to shift into them. That truck driver who loses their job to a driverless truck isn't going to easily become an app developer out in Silicon Valley. Hmm. Interesting, hey? So the current stats are sort of saying that, um, uh, and these are stats obviously from, from Amazon, that since, um, uh, since oh, by, by 2022, uh, artificial intelligence will create 58 million uh, new jobs. Um, but once those things are replaced and up and running, it'll be interesting to see the impact that's going to have on the rest of workplaces around the world too and how many uh, jobs will be diminishing. So jobs... We know by history that jobs were, that uh, uh, weren't there today are there tomorrow, or new jobs are being created, but it's going to be see, interesting to see the entire impact. Uh, but we know, at the end of the day, that humans are really good at uh, problem solving, they're really good at abstraction, they're really good at generalisation and creative thinking. Robots can't do that. Uh, robots are good at um, crunching those numbers, uh, repetitive tasks, you know, heavy lifting, uh, getting jobs done for humans, so taking away a lot of those manual elements. But it's certainly going to be interesting to see where, where that goes. So another little question there for you, back onto our survey. Uh, does your uh, organisation uh, currently have an innovation strategy? I'm just going to close that poll and open up this one. So do you currently have, not are you innovative, but do you have a documented innovation strategy? Low murmurings out there. Yeah, that's that's generally the answer we see. The the stats are about um, from uh, sessions I've run in the past. Uh, they're they're about there. They're about there. So about a third do, and two thirds don't. We're almost spot on. Come on, someone give me, give me those figures right to the T. Great. Awesome. So, look, it's, um, it's an important thing and it's something I want to talk more about. Um, 
every CEO will tell you generally, you know, when they're out at their forums and uh, out in their, uh, uh, at the various conferences and places around the world that yes, they do have an innovation strategy. Uh, it's like having a, it's like having the, the cool thing to say in the schoolyard these days. Um, it's like having the coolest sneakers. Yeah, I've got those sneakers. Or it's like having analytics. Are you using analytics in your LMS? Yeah, we've got analytics. We probably only really need basic reporting in a lot of instances, but yeah, we've got analytics. We use about 10% of it. Um, it's, it's sort of a, a bit of a bit of a buzzword to, to a lot of organisations. Uh, but if you ask them about their innovation strategy, generally you'll get, yeah, that sort of Jim Jeffries sort of look, yeah. Um, and they don't actually have one. So let's talk about what is innovation. So innovation by definition uh, is the cre uh, creation and delivery of new customer value in the marketplace with a sustainable business model. So um, you need to obviously be able to have that sustainable base to keep your innovation going because innovation isn't just a once-off thing. It's an ongoing practice. Um, so where do most uh, uh, well, innovations or uh, the like um, start? Well, they start here and where we see most of the, the value, uh, well, most of the failures is in the R&D space. So people do a lot of R&D. We certainly do a lot of R&D. And you can't expect all of the things you put into the R&D machine to come out at the other end as perfectly beautiful, ready-to-go products. It just, it's not the way the world works. It's a... Uh, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. Um, the stat there is from Stanford University, which is you know, that less than 20% of R&D has any value, uh, and it's so true. Um, you, you sort of get down to that, think of that C to spare uh, product that we built before. Hey, it's a great idea, but oh, somebody else has done it, falls into the C to spare. Oh, well, we can't actually do that with the technology we have today, falls into the C to spare. Oh, it's gonna cost way too much uh, for us to build a viable business model around. Oh, it falls into the C of despair. Um, the definition of a value uh, proposition has these four points. So you need a need, obviously. So who wants it? Is, is, there, is there a customer for it? Is there a buyer for it? You need an approach to market. Uh, you need to demonstrate uh, benefits uh, of that product out in the market. And then you also need to check out uh, competitors. So who's out there doing something exactly the same thing? Now, when you innovate or you create something, you don't need to create something from scratch all the time. Uh, you know, a, a lot of companies, uh, many, many successful companies have been built off improving something that's already out there. So making the existing one better. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can get a lot of traction uh, with those uh, types of approaches. The most common failure, though, is in that approach. So how many times have you watched uh, TED Talks, an exa example, and they stand there and they go, you know, we want to change the world. We want to make the world a better place. You know, they say all these wonderful things and that's as far as they get, the idea stage and their approach to the market, they know that it will appeal to people, but they think about, uh, they don't think about the model that needs to, to live around that. So impactful uh, innovations uh, start through here. So what's the value to the customer? What's the value creation? And you won't always, uh, a lot of the time, you won't end up where you initially sort of set out to be. So you won't hit that bullseye you put in the sky and go, yes, we did exactly that. A lot of the time, you're learning a lot of stuff along the way as well. And you're going, yeah, okay, I see what we were thinking of there in the first instance, but because we've had so many workshops now, we've tried different ideas and different examples, uh, where we ended up is not exactly um, where we set out to be. We ended up in the right place, doing the right things. A uh, little fact here, I've got a couple of fun facts through my slide decks so I always like to throw in, but Siri, for example, wasn't created by Apple. Everybody thinks it was. Siri used to be an early app um, on the App Store that you could download and it would give you basic answers to, to basic questions that you could answer. Um, interesting uh, little saying there, so, so Siri is actually a Norwegian name, which means beautiful woman who guides you to victory, um, which I guess Siri does guide us to many, many things these days. Um, obviously three voices Siri initially came out with. There was an Australian voice, uh, a US voice, and an English voice. Um, so built uh, predominantly for the Western world when it started out. Um, but an interesting story. So uh, it was developed by, uh, by SRI and they sort of worked on it through iteration to iteration. Then Steve Jobs came in and gave them an offer for, uh, for, the, for the piece of uh, software and they went, no, 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 that's way too low. Then he came back about 18 months later with a ridiculously huge offer and they went, yeah, okay, you got us, yeah, yeah, take the thing. And they've obviously gone to embed that in all their products. Um, now, 
when I speak of innovations, there's our own innovations and the like as well too. I won't spend too much time on that because they are commercial in nature and we've got Moodle in the room. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll move on from those, but we can talk about those any other time. Little saying I love is this one. People don't want a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. So you want the result. You don't necessarily care as a consumer or a user how you get that result. Just give me what I need. Um, and I've got a little, uh, that's by Ted Levitt, that saying, but I've got another little um, saying below that which you can't quite see. But having an LMS without good content is like having a classroom without a good teacher. So, you know, you need to pack things into your LMS which are going to bring people back. Uh, especially in the workplace, we see learning management systems that are uh, uh, just used for compliance. So you've got this uh, heavy lifting uh, horse, if you like, that's carrying a 25 gram bag, bag of peanuts. You know, the LMS can do so much more than just run your compliance content, just you know, tick the boxes, so to speak. So we want to figure out uh, what that can do. And we'll do some more of that too in, in this session in, and in the Go One session that we have later on with our new partners. So let's look at ideas uh, through to commercialization. Um, another great little saying, to every person with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So how do you hit a nail in it? Bang, you just do it the same way you've always done it before. You know, click, click. Uh, to, to, so people think that that uh, approach can solve every problem. It's not necessarily so. Uh, so I'd like to give you some insight into how we run uh, innovation at, at Air Creators. So this is where we start. So first of all, we go into idea incubation. Um, so we incubate the idea. We test customer desirability. So we won't pick up a tool at all until we talk to our user base. So until we're talking to our users out there that are going to end up using the product. And really we have, especially in the corporate landscape, uh, three types of users. We've got administrators, we've got managers, and we've got learners. Three separate audiences. We can't predict, we can have a go at it, we can use a little bit of prediction about what they're going to need now and into the future. We need to ask the students about how they want to view it and how they want to consume it and take the best of that. Um, so really important to do. You don't have to spend forever doing it. I mean, uh, depending on the scale of the project, I mean, um, uh, it can take a couple of weeks, it can take a week, it can take months. Our general cycle, though, is three to four weeks of getting that, that team together. What you want to try and do with those teams, too, is keep them part of your product journey. So don't choose a different team perhaps every time you're creating new additions and functionality to your products. Get that team that's already experienced and been part of that journey and let them expand their minds and grow with the product. Certainly pain point interviews. So uh, with existing products going to your consumers, again being your learners or your teachers or your managers and saying to them, if we could change one thing about the system, what would it be? Oh, this. If we could change five things, what would that be? Um, you know, and keep these groups small too. You know, don't invite, like if, for example, if we were trying to redesign a plug-in for the LMS now, this would be way too many people. Max people you want in a room for, for those types of scenarios is about eight people. You, know, you want the right eight people, and sometimes you'll rotate some of those people, but you don't want everyone. You want to be all, all things to everybody. Conduct some storyboard interviews. So just as where you might build uh, e-learning content and have a storyboard for content, have a storyboard that people can look at and say, look, we've mocked up a few UI designs. What do you think of these? Oh, that's not bad, but it'd be great if that button was blue or if I could access all learning resources from the front page or um, if I could just do, come to the LMS and say, right, I don't want to sit here and manually farm for a course. I want you to show me LMS uh, pieces of learning which I can complete in three minutes. Get those ideas out. You know, get the incubation going. And then, um, obviously, you know, a customer engagement never sleeps. So keep talking to your customers using your products and, and make sure that you're uh, getting that involved. Next stage is determining feasibility. So can we actually build this thing? You know, um, you're not building the Death Star at the end of the day, but you need to uh, figure out, you know, uh, can you, with your internal resources, actually build this tool or this platform or this plug, it, plug into this product? So what are the possibilities and where are the, uh, the negatives and positives there? 
Uh, do you, can you do it with your own resources? Do you need to hire new resources to do this? You know, you see more and more organisations these days hiring product managers, dedicated product managers, to look after that particular thing within your organisation. Or can you use the gig economy? So, you know, uh, just a basic show of hands. How many people here use Airtasker? Not many. That was a few. Not as many as I thought, though. What about Fiverr? Anyone ever use Fiverr? Same people. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, well, the, the, these uh, gig-style economies where people just jump on, uh, do a job for you, and it could be uh, like Fiverr, for example, you might want a logo designed or you might want a paper written or a template done or you might want a, a plug-in created or you might want uh, a Moodle course template created. You can do that through the gig economy. And Fiverr uh, is a very popular platform for that. Um, certainly, Airtask is great. So if you haven't got, haven't got those times uh, to do things around the house or you move, want to move something for A, B to, a to B or get a load taken to the tip, um, you can do that through Airtasker. They'll take on any task at all and you just say how much you want to pay for it. Um, the gig economy is a, a great one, especially for those um, who are in between work or want a supplemental income or perhaps are at university or any of those uh, types of places that want to make a few bucks on the side. Um, huge. Access, third, third step there is assess business viability. So can this thing actually make money? Again, if you're uh, making a product which is uh, where you want to change the world or you want to uh, uh, create something new for your university or institution or organisation, uh, is it sustainable? Um, you know, one thing that we uh, are pretty proud of at eCreators is we work for customers, not shareholders. Now, working for a customer versus a shareholder type organisation is a totally different thing. You get a totally different end result. Um, I think when you're talking to um, customers that are driven by the shareholder dollar, uh, they're not thinking about completely the customer. A lot of time they're thinking about closing budgets and meeting big targets. Uh, but one of the most um, important questions you'll ask, especially towards the end of the cycle, is uh, to, to ask your customers, you know, if, if you had this or if we created this, would you buy it? And if you can't get that, at that answer at the, the very start of the process, um, you're probably missing the mark. So it's back to the storing board, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, storyboard again. Then, of course, final stage is um, ongoing management. So we go back into that cyclic view. We're going iterative. We're going back again. We're, we're producing new ver versions. Also, don't create this. A lot of organisations, when they, when they innovate, they try to do the whole lot all at once. We're going to create a new learning management system. So what are some of the risks there? A, you've got all your, your eggs in one basket. Your chances of failure are much higher. And if you do fail, you fail big. You lose money, you can lose people along the way, uh, you can lose your, your edge on innovation because you're not getting to market quick enough or getting to your audience quick enough. Um, so take a, a number of small bets release things in small iterations. So this piece of functionality, then this piece of functionality, you'll find then too you'll get momentum. You'll get a gathering uh, of people wanting to use your product as more of these bright, shiny, wonderful, interactive things come out. So small bets, not great, big, reinvent the wheel bets. And you'll find that all organisations do this. Uh, a little saying there by Bruce Mao, it's not about the world of design, but the design of the world. Pretty deep, I know. So solving problems. So thinking outside the box is a big one. A great old saying from, from Einstein. It's actually a great little uh, documentary you can uh, watch on Netflix at the moment um, uh, about Einstein and about how he, his theory of relativity got there. And then uh, uh, there was two years before that, he'd messed up one of the calculations, which destroyed all the other calculations down the road. So we had to go all the way back to the start of this complex uh, theorem as it was. Um, but one of his saying is you can't solve the problems with the same kind of thinking you use to create them because generally they're different problems. So attack them from, from different angles. Here's a little story um, about a little thing called the Norman door. Now after I show you this clip, you're going to see these doors everywhere you go. Um, you'll have a little chuckle to yourself. But let's have a look at a case of uh, a little story from a guy called Don Norman. Um, now, Don Norman wrote a book called The Design of Everyday Things. If you are getting into innovation, into product design, into any type of design, read The Design of Everyday Things. It's a good foundation book. But let's have a little look um, about his story. 
There's this door on the 10th floor of the Vox Media office that I hate so much. God damn it. Do you ever get this door wrong? Pretty regularly. Have you seen people misuse it? All the time, every day. Constantly. I hate this door. <laughs> Me too, Kelsey. But here's the thing. As soon as you start looking for confusing doors, they are everywhere. It's push. Why? I feel like Roman Mars would know about this. This is 99% invisible. And those doors you hate are called Norman doors. Um, what's a Norman door? Don Norman wrote the essential book about design. He is the Norman of the Norman door. All right, and where is this guy? You must go to San Diego. OK. <laughs> Don Norman. I'm... Gee, you know, it's hard to describe what I am. Well, he's been a professor of psychology, professor of cognitive science, professor of computer science, a vice president of advanced technology at Apple. But for our purposes... I was spending a year in England. <laughs> I got so frustrated with my inability to use the light switches and the water taps and the doors, even, that I wrote this book. If I continually get a door wrong, is it my fault? No. In fact, if you continually get it wrong, is it good? But if other people continually get it wrong, good sign that it's a really bad door. A Norman door is one where the design tells you to do the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do, or gives the wrong signal and needs a sign to correct it. Why does it need an instruction manual? That is, why do you have to have a sign that says push or pull? Why not make it obvious? It can be obvious, if it's designed right. There are a couple of really simple, basic principles of design, and one of them I'll call discoverability. When I look at something, I should be able to discover what operations I can do. The principle applies to a whole lot more than doors. And it's amazing with many of our computer systems today, you look at it, there's no way of knowing what's possible. Should I uh, tap it once or twice or even triple tap? So discoverability, when it's not there, well, you don't know how to use something. Another is feedback. And so many times there's no feedback. You have no idea what happened or why it happened. And these principles form the basis of how designers and engineers work today commonly known as user or human-centered design. I decided at one point the word user was a bit degrading. Why not call people people? And it's amazingly simple and amazingly seldom practiced. We call it iterative because it sort of goes around in a circle. We go out and we observe what is happening today. We observe people doing the task. And from that, we say, oh, we have some ideas. Here's what we should perhaps propose to do. Then you prototype your solution and test it. Quite often these are wrong at first, but each time we go around the circle, we do a better job of making the device until the point we're actually making something that really works. And this process has spread all over the world. And it turns out it's improving lives. From better everyday things like the ones that Don wrote about. To using the same process to solve huge problems in public health in developing countries. Water. Sanitation. Farming. Lots more. So what would be a better human-centered door? An ideal door is one that as I walk up to it and walk through it, I'm not even aware that I had opened the door and shut it. So if you had a door which had a flat plate, what could you do? Nothing. The only thing you can do is push. So see, you wouldn't need a sign. A flat plate, you push. This kind of push bar with the piece sticking out on one side works well too. So you can see what side you're supposed to push on. The vertical bars could go either way. A simple little hand thing though sort of indicates but we still have terrible, terrible doors in the world. So many of them. There are lots of things in life that are fairly standardized, and therefore, whether I buy this house or not is not a function of whether it has good doors in it. And so, uh, except for safety reasons, doors tend not to be improved. But the tyranny of bad doors must end. I think that it's a really shit design. Right? They put a pull handle when it's a push. And that should be a flat panel right here. And not a f***ing That's how I feel about the store. It's very misleading. I agree. You're right, Becky. You're goddamn right. And if we all thought like you, well, we might just design a better world together. It won't 
open because it's a security door. What the f are you two doing? Hey, so as you can see, since I started making this video, they've uh, since changed the door a little bit. Uh, I guess it's a step in the right direction. Thank you so much for watching, and to 99% Invisible, one of my favorite podcasts. It was so much fun to collaborate with them. Thank you, and ch There you go, the Norman door. So, the, se the secret of design uh, on something so basic. Um, I actually did the same thing getting out this door just the other day, which is, by chance, a Norman door. So good luck to you getting out of that door. Every time you see one of these things now, you're going to think of that. Um, and think of that as one of the most you know, basic fundamentals of design. You know, Design it for humans, for people, uh, how, how it's meant to be. Don't make it difficult. Don't overthink it. Or you know, the worst person you can get to design some, something is a developer. You know, Developers there go, oh, great, 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 I've designed it. Um, a lot of the times, uh, you'll also get developers to test it. What's going to happen if you get a developer um, to test their own code? They're going to test it in the way they wrote it, not in how it's actually going to be used. So testing is really, really, really important. Okay, so uh, just the, the epic problem, as it's called. So in the case of uh, solving the normal door, the epic problem is that faceplate. If you need to put a sign on something to tell you how to do something, that's not good design, it's as simple as that. You, know, um, you don't need a big button that says click here, you might need a brighter coloured button in a more logical place which says click here. So this brings on uh, another thing called the tame problem and the wicked problem. And these things generally interact, they, they uh, overlap rather. Um, when you've got a tame problem, it's a known known. So you know what the basic problem is, you probably know a lot about the product, you know how it works. That overlays with when you're improving something, uh, the unknown known. So you know most of what's going on, but there's, there's new things that you haven't quite grasped or haven't got your head around. And this is where you start your discovery phase, so understanding exactly how these things work. Then there's the unknown unknown. And the unknown unknown is something that your company may never have had exposure to. Uh, a lot of people feel safe in that no one, no one space, so they don't jump out. They're not innovative companies. The ones that are are the ones that tackle those big unknown unknowns. And you'll find over time that as you do more iteration, as you uh, do more group thinking, um, that unknown unknown becomes no one unknown until finally it's no one known. You'll always have things that are unknown known. I know I'm saying unknown known a lot, uh, <laughs> uh, but the diagram explains it probably a little bit better than I'm, I'm saying it. Um, but obviously this goes into those three stages. So there's the I ideal generation stage where you, you're group thinking about your solution. There's building your product prototypes, you know, building your low fidelity prototypes, which might just show a workflow as to how something works. And then your high fidelity, which show all the pretty UIs and there's lots of great tools you can use to create those really good interactive user interfaces uh, that are just dummies, They're just beautiful images joined together versus having to write lines of code and go back and fix that. And then, of course, there's um, getting, uh, getting feedback. So talking with your personas. So having that user research that um, uh, people seldom uh, forget to do, or they're doing their user research in the wrong places. So group thinking, uh, or that brainstorming uh, uh, section, is, is, is one of those uh, important uh, parts too. So um, a lot of the time you've got obviously teams inside your organisations. If you don't, there's plenty of tools that you can use. One good tool, tool is Miro, so M-I-R-O.com. If you've got uh, uh, an audience where they're remote and you need to work on things in tandem, yeah, there's other tools out there. There's Microsoft Teams and uh, all the rest as well too. But some of the most important things are making sure you have the right amount of people in the room and grab people from different parts of the organisation too. You want end users, you want administrators, you want managers, you want a good, uh, good blend. Um, set it into time blocks as well. One of the things that you, you, you try to do when you're um, solving wicked problems and the like is you, uh, you try to use a whole day. Okay, we're going to take a whole day out of the business, and we're going to get all these ideas down and we're going to solve them all. It doesn't work like that. Give yourself blocks of time uh, and make short little wins. Come back, reflect on those wins, finalise those wins, go on to your next stage. So really uh, chop it up into chunks. And then think about 
um, sustainable things to achieve too. So we call them HMWs, how might we? Um, so there's a couple of examples down the bottom there. So don't be too broad, like how might we make people happy? Pretty broad. Uh, don't be too narrow. Uh, how might we make the buy button blue? I mean, we can solve that in two minutes. Um, but an example might be how might we use the learner's location to show them relevant results of courses around them or uh, books they can buy or educational uh, lectures and the like coming up. So focus on something that's really sustainable and tangible. Um, different ways to get feedback. Um, this whole deck will be made available to you too. So if you're taking notes, awesome. But if you want a copy of the deck, just let me know. Um, getting feedback, so how do we do this? How do we prepare for effective uh, user research? Certainly engage your stakeholders, find those personas. So find extremes as well too, so find older users, find younger users, people in between. Um, you know, definitely a, a, a where you're involving customers and the like, maybe have some sort of uh, incentive for them to come along and be a part of uh, the user group as well. People are incentivized by rewards. We all know that from our eBay stars and our likes and our hashtags and, and these sorts of things. Uh, seek validation. So script everything. So the learner knows what they need to look at when they do come along. So it's not just saying, hey, here's our LMS. What do you think? You, know, you give them a script to follow. Uh, when you look at the header, um, do you have all the information you need on the header? No, I'd like this. So we can really validate that script. I've got a little template you can use for that. Uh, prototypes are big. A lot of people are very you know, visual thinkers these days. So you can't just sort of talk, we're going to build this uh, amazing team plugin for your learning management system. Show me what it looks like. Show me what your ideas are. Allow me to scribble on it and mark, mark up my changes and give my feedback. These are all really part, important parts of, of product design. Um, Certainly run independent interviews as well too. So it might be someone outside the group uh, after you've done all these changes and created all these great ideas uh, who comes out and says, okay, uh, user number one, uh, what did you think of the e-commerce plugin? So non-biased feedback from somebody who hasn't been in the design team or in the creation team. Completely different point of view. And obviously make sure you record those um, notes as well. And I always audio record feedback sessions. Uh, if you just take handwritten notes, uh, some of the problems is they're open to interpretation. How many times have you made a note, been at a conference, for example, you might get back to these notes, and you'll go, what the hell was I thinking there, or what did he actually say there? What was, what was that component? So if, you're, if you make an audio or a video type recording that you can go back and watch and listen to, you fill in a lot of those gaps. Really important. Some really good tools you can use there too. Look back, IO is one. Um, and for product white, whiteboarding, uh, productboard.com. Uh, I'm not endorsing any of these products, by the way. I'm just saying that they're good products to use and products that we've had success with in the past as well. Um, there's obviously limitations, getting back to my unknown unknowns, in what you can solve alone as well too. So um, these are some of the things that you can use. Obviously, you know, talk, observe, ask feedback from your learners. Uh, if you're developing software and the like, pair programming is really good. One of the things Amazon do when they have outages, for example, from a support point of view, and Amazon don't have a great deal of outages, but when they do, they have a senior engineer who comes in and a junior engineer that comes in. And they could be in different parts of the world on different time zones or whichever. But what they do is they get together, they analyse the problem, and then they agree on a fix. So if I was working with Michael, I'd say, Michael, I reckon uh, we need to reset the cron job. Michael would go, he'd look at the, uh, the problem himself, look at it and go, yes, I do agree, Dean. We reset the cron job and then we'll do that and apply that to production. So there's a lot of pair programming. Um, certainly user research and certainly constant, constant brainstorming. This is an example of an empathy map. And this is an empathy map about buying a TV. Um, but it is one of those things that is really good to do with your end user. So what your user is saying, what your user does when they actually go out to buy a TV, what they think when they're buying a TV, and how they feel when they're buying a TV. Um, they're all four important quadrants to, to take notice of and all, uh, all too forgotten when people are thinking about building products as well too. So make sure you involve these uh, processes. So it uh, thinks, you know, uh, the, the user, for example, when buying a TV thinks, oh, this is too hard, there's too many choices. Uh, do I need a plasma or an LCD? Uh, what size do I need? Is the size going to fit for me? Um, they think I'm stupid because I don't know what HDMI and RCA and optical do. Um, these are the important things that you need to ask those basic users when you're, when you're building things. 
And obviously how you feel, while it might sound warm and fluffy, uh, the better I feel about a system that I'm using, the more likely I am to come back and do other things. So uh, again, um, defining the wicked problem and the tame problem. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, when you're looking at these uh, uh, big problems, don't feel like you need to reinvent the wheel. Reuse ideas that are already out there, make them better, make products better. Uh, for wicked problems where uh, the, prog uh, the, the problem is more complex, that's where we get into that no stopping rule. We're iterating, iterating, iterating until we, until we hit that. A good example is Elon Musk. So Elon Musk accepted the challenge for cheaper space travel. So pretty big, wicked problem. You know, I'm a private organisation, I need to get a shuttle up there uh, at a much cheaper cost, otherwise I can't win contracts with NASA or, or anybody else. Um, so how do I do that? So my wicked problem is, how do I launch cheaper? How do I get that up there at a quarter of the cost, or much less cost? Um, okay, I need to find a cheaper fuel source. That's the first thing. So I'm going to use liquid oxygen, uh, which will cut down my launch cost. And I'm going back to how I launch cheaper again. It's still too expensive, because I'm having to build these bits of rocket that fall into the ocean or fall into the atmosphere that are, I can't reuse. So I'm having to build a space vehicle, which takes me a long time, every time. Imagine the testing that must go into launching a, a rocket into space. I mean, you can't go, great, oh yeah, rocket 105. Build me three 105s, Johnny. You know, it's, it's not about that. They're going to have to go through that massive, massive testing phase again. So in this case, let's build a reusable rocket. A rocket that can take off by itself, deploy its payload, then come back to Earth and land. It might change a few parts, give it a bit of a clean off, and then off she goes again. Same thing. So not all big, wicked problems can be solved. A lot of them take a, a lot more time to solve, and it does uh, require a lot of that sort of uh, critical thinking. Um, so again, you can solve everything, but not everything at once. So this is uh, coming back to taking it into those little chunks. And I've used the illustration here. Um, uh, of a skateboard. So you, you really want a motorbike, uh, but don't build the motorbike first of all. Go on that staged approach. And you'll see that I've got MVP, minimum viable product. So that's what you want first of all. Get to market with, that, with the skateboard. Let the users test it. Give your feedback. Do your changes internally. Back to the user. What do you think, user? That's great. Eventually I've ended up there with the push bike. Over time, iteration, 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 I put a motor on it. It's, 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 it goes now, it's a Vespa, I've got room for my helmet, iteration, 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 and now I've got the super motorbike that I had the original dream about um, through a series of um, MVP versions from prototype through the version 3, version 4, version 5. This is the way software manufacturers work, and you see it a lot. You know, uh, Moodle 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, an iterative approach. Then also prototypes. So these again are really good for your users. So Start with basic, basic prototypes about how you want your product to be mapped and, and to look and feel. Um, move on to a wireframe, again, again, once you've got some of that feedback. And then into your digital mock-ups, your hi-fi mock-ups, as, as they're known as. Then there's two ways to add um, thinking into your product pipeline. So this is the when. So uh, in your product design layer here, you've got understanding what the, pro uh, the problem is and generating the ideas. You've got prototyping, and you're testing those ideas with feedback from your customers. Then you're going into design sprints, measuring their effectiveness, understanding those, and then prototyping and testing again. Whereas your tech team down the bottom here uh, are designing their technical design, uh, and then they're going into their, into their development sprints before you actually get a release. So these two things can often run in tandem before you get your product out to your customer. I mentioned before the customer journey map, and this is a, a sample of a template that you can use, which is available from NN Groups. So NN Groups are uh, uh, Don Norman's own group, if you like. But in this template, what we're seeing at the top there, where you can see one and two, uh, are the scenarios, so the lens for the people working on giving you feedback for your products. So they're asking you for your ideas, your, your scenarios, your goals and expectations. Zone B is the experience. So you're mapping out or giving your, your, your learner or your audience or your uh, users uh, a map of exactly how it's going to work and giving them the chance to provide feedback on your products. 
So I tried this button, it didn't work. That better would be button, but, but butter would be better if it was over there. Um, I couldn't find this button, I couldn't find this report. And then we talk about the opportunities, so the insights down below. Um, so what are the opportunities to improve on this design or on this journey map uh, for this particular group of users or product users? And then there's finally internal ownership. So what, was, what we're going to do as a result of this. This is another little fun fact to sort of chuck in at this stage as well. Um, we're obviously building things in nanometers at the moment, which is 0 0.0000001 of a meter. So nanometers are so small, they're as thin as a strand of DNA, but in the next five seconds, um, your fingernail will grow a nanometer, if you watch it really closely. So uh, this is you know, the level of innovation we're dealing with in, in the technical space, in the technology space about how fast things are moving and also how small uh, some of the technologies that we're using as well. Just a little fun fact I thought I'd throw in. Okay, so it's great that we're creating these products, but how do we get these products to market? And how do we get uh, people using them? Um, another question for, uh, for you on the survey. So how many people at the moment uh, may be disrupting a market? Some of you may not be working in markets, so you can just be others if you like. Um, but how many people here feel they have a product which could disrupt a market? Cool. That's a really good amount of yeses. So I want to have a conversation with all you guys because that sounds like you've got some great stuff going out of there, some, uh, some great ideas. No, that's really good. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we've also got, um, I've just been given my 15 minute warning, but we've got some questions coming through at the moment too, which I'll, I'll get to. So don't forget to ask questions in the forum there and we'll get to some of those for you at the end of, end of this as well. So in the old school way for, to disrupt a market, it was all done through marketing. Marketing used to be the weapon for that. You know, what do I wear? Uh, what are the cool shoes? What do I drink? Where should I eat? Um, you know, infomercials, creation of fake tribes, if you like, you know. Um, you want to be one of those guys or girls on the Coca-Cola ad running in slow motion and, you know, ah, oh, I've got to drink Coca-Cola so I can be like that. Um, doesn't really work anymore. Uh, we're a bit uh, more clever uh, than that. So we use other stuff. This is a great little uh, short clip I'll show you from Harvard University, uh, which is entitled Disruptive Innovation. Um, I noticed a couple of people nod, so maybe you've seen it before, but for the, the benefit of those who haven't, let's look at how little tiny organisations can disrupt big markets, uh, which is what we're, we're, uh, a, lot of, a lot of us are about. How does a small, young company beat an industry giant on its own turf? Through what Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen calls disruptive innovation. It works like this. Big players focus on sustaining innovation upgrading existing products and services to attract higher paying customers. But soon, they start to ignore all the regular customers who just want simple, low cost alternatives. That's where the entrepreneurial company jumps in with that basic offering. The big guys stay focused on more profitable customers and begin to overserve, adding bells and whistles no one wants to pay for. Meanwhile, the disruptor improves its product to appeal to more people. By the time the incumbent notices, the disruptor has already started to take over the market. The classic example is the steel mini mills, which first produced low quality rebar, then moved to sheet steel, stealing business from the large mills that had been dominant. More recent disruptors include car makers like Toyota and Hyundai, which launched with economy models, then added luxury features and brands. The only way for industry giants to fight back is by launching their own disruptive innovations. To succeed, they must treat the project as a separate unit with a different business model and growth expectations. Ask what job do customers need to get done? Segment customers by job, not by product, market size, or demographics. And develop basic low-cost ways to get the job done. That's how Procter & Gamble came up with Crest White Strips, a cheap do-it-yourself alternative to an expensive dental service. Disruptive innovation creates new markets and reshapes existing ones. To achieve growth in a fast-changing world, you want to be a disruptor. Don't be disrupted. Yeah, interesting saying there, you know, you want to be disruptive, don't be disruptive. And 
it is um, important to disrupt yourselves every now and then. As a, sorry. I was talking away without talking to the microphone. It is important to um, uh, disrupt, disrupt yourselves every now and then too, to sort of be self-disruptive. So again, you don't become complacent. Um, it's a really good example there of, of how that works. And, and certainly Uber uh, was one of those disruptors with uh, and a good example to use. You know, everybody sort of knows them. Uh, but with the taxi industry, I mean, Uber couldn't attack, you know, a global ta taxi industry head on it would have been almost suicidal. You know, they've been there, they're established, they've got networks of cars and drivers and all the rest. So they sort of attack from the flank. They create, created a product which was right next door, right next to the taxi industry. Um, and because they weren't being attacked head on, there was, there was no real battle. They couldn't sort of grab them. There was no way to, it was like an old field battle where you've got, you know, the, the British army at one side and the other army on the other end. You sort of get in the middle and clash and sort it all out. Um, Uber couldn't do that with that li their little army against the taxi industry. So um, by doing it in parallel, uh, you have to watch the thing grow and there's no real way to respond to it. And you can certainly see that uh, the taxi industry hasn't really responded well to, uh, to Uber's market share either. Um, another little fun fact there, Hoya, um, who's a, like a uh, white goods type brand, um, one of the things they do, uh, one of the successful things that their products have been is they treat their staff as more or less shareholders in their organisation. So they pay them sort of lower wages and effectively all of the employees are involved in the organisation earn 10 times their normal size salaries simply because um, they're, they feel more like owners in their organisation versus employees. So therefore all their love, all their, uh, all their energy and the like goes into making sure that their, their products are a success. Just a little one, uh, getting close to, to wrap up here, a little exercise for you. Um, and this is called the demand curve. And the demand curve will help you um, uh, figure out how to price your products. So if I was to ask you two questions, and I'll have to get a show of hands for this one. So if I said to you, you had a 50% uh, a uh, chance of winning $100 in a lottery, how much would you be willing to pay for the ticket? I'll get a, I'll get a rough show of hands. Who's, um, who's 60 and above? No, no one. Who's 30 and above? Yeah, okay, if you're back there. Yes, yeah, a few, few more. Who's, who's zero? <laughs> Any zeros? No, no, no one plays lottery. What about 10 bucks? You're willing to pay 10 bucks for it. Okay, so you're, you're taking a bit of risk there. So you've seen the, the value prop. And what if I said to you, you have an 80% chance uh, of, uh, of um, winning this lottery, this $100 lottery? Uh, how much would you be willing to pay for the ticket then? Would it be $10? 20 30? Yeah, 40? 50 bucks. Yeah? Okay, so most of you are in the sort of lower percentile. Um, but yeah, this helps us uh, uh, figure out, it needs to be something you do think about when you're, um, when you're uh, designing products too. What's your value proposition? What are you going to go to market with? Uh, and what, uh, how are you going to set the pricing for, for all of your products? And the demand curve's a, a good way to play with that. Um, just before I do go, there's uh, some recommended reading here. So these are books that uh, you can bring into your organisation which talk a lot about innovation and about change. Um, so How to Disrupt Yourself, uh, How to Take Little Bets, uh, Bruce Mao, great author. Um, two I'm sort of, I always go back to uh, Free the Idea Monkey and Design Thinking and Strategic Innovation as well. Two of those are very, very good books that you can add to your arsenal. So you can get these these days on you know, your Amazons. They can be read to you and audio cast and all the rest. Or you can get the old uh, uh, hardcover ones. So give them a good look. And before you go today, I'm going to give you a magic circle. So this magic circle talks about that innovative or iterative approach that we spoke about before, uh, which shows you from, um, from understanding your, your customer all the way through the cycle to ideating, to testing and materialising. Now, because you came here, you get one. So you can go out and brag and say, I've got a magic circle and you haven't, um, out to the rest of the crowd. But they'll be available up on the back bar there. You can see uh, four piles of them. Cool. So we've got some questions. I'm going to jump into the question side of things. And we'll probably have a time for a few more, I think, Michael. Sure. Yeah. Okay, what do we got? Pretty 
Questions? Have a look. Uh, okay, so from Anonymous. Uh, my name is David, first of all. Hi, David, wherever you are. Um, where, do you, where do you see gaps in the ed tech space? Well, look, the, there's, there's a lot. I mean, you, you've got um, uh, organisations, an organisation came out of the States now called AMBI, A-M-B-I, I'm not sure whether you've seen it, but um, it's something I touched on before about collaboration in the ed tech space. So uh, learners coming to uh, the, the LMS based out of necessity. Um, Ambi, what they've done is they've created a, a modern, slick UI which sits on top of Canvas, it sits on top of Blackboard, it sits on top of Moodle, which helps to create this, this tribe really modern, slick type look and feel. So certainly usability uh, is one. Certainly quality content is one. Uh, and again, I mean, uh, I was having a conversation with the, uh, the Go Ones, uh, at the Go One guys out there before. Having uh, an empty LMS or an LMS that doesn't have much content is like having a classroom with no teacher. You know, you need to fill uh, your system with useful things. Um, Sally spoke for me, Creator spoke yesterday about um, using your. LMS for, for, for different uh, models of business. So that's things like change management, so communicating change. Uh, so if there's an update from the CEO, I log into the LMS to see the update from the CEO. If uh, we're experiencing change across the country or change across the world or whichever, you can communicate a consistent message by using your LMS. So uh, you need to also almost use some um, design thinking, if you like, or cons constructive uh, thinking in in ways you can use your LMS to, uh, to to manipulate what it's doing now. So there's there's just a couple of things, but certainly um, you know portability is a big one. Certainly credibility is a big one. Um, you know uh, we're seeing uh, the bricks and mortar university type learning uh, sit over here, and, and university get, universities are getting smarter and smarter about what they do as far as utilization of, of technology goes. Um, but I think a lot of the Workplace organisations are also getting better about how they serve uh, education to their learner base as well. Can we have the recipe to your signature barbecue dish? Yeah, well, my favourite one is actually burnt pork ends, but anyone who wants to talk barbecue after this, I'll, um, I'll take you through that more than happy. Um, yeah, legalities around your innovations when you're a small business starting out. I know this backwards, so look, I could, I could spend hours talking on this. Um, first of all, you need uh, a good IP lawyer, if you like, to make sure you're not stepping on the toes of giants, for example, and there's a lot of those that, um, when you hear the word lawyer, you always think expensive. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be the phone. There's, there's, uh, there's micro lawyers these days, or lawyers that work just for startups, so they can certainly give you a lot of... Uh, good advice about what you can do in in domestic territories or international territories, help you set up. I mean, uh, when we were recently over in Silicon Valley, we've recently opened up in the United States and, you know, we had this, you know, guys in suits with their glasses on and all specked out talking about, you know, how much it's going to cost us to start up an LLC in, um, in the United States and, you know, we're talking 15, 20,000 US and you're sort of going, oh, that's a bit of money. Um, you can do it through Harvard Business, business School for 300 bucks. I mean, so a lot of it's about um, being smarter uh, about where you, where you find these things. And, um, yeah, so cer certainly with small business, if anyone ever wants to spend some time on talking through some of that stuff, I'm more than happy to come and talk to you or come out of our stand today if you like and we can help you out. Um, how do you uh, measure design sprints and know that they're working? Um, well, again, it's about reviewing and having that prototype team or that user uh, team, that user-centric team, always being part of that process. So don't take it, um, don't leave it just inside your organisation, but uh, get involved with the end users who are being impacted by the change. And, and what made you think of bringing uh, innovation to learning systems? Uh, again, it's iterative. Um, you know, no one person or one organisation has all the answers and I guess, you know, the beauty of the product that most of us here use, which is Moodle, it allows us to do that. You know, we can, we can create plugins, we can create new eyes, uh, we can get together to discuss ideas and, and new innovations. So that's one of the beautiful things about it. I think I'm out of time. We do have one more thing though. Um, this news just in.
It's nothing too serious, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, we have our award, um, which we're going to present to uh, the winner of our virtual reality headset um, from popping by for our stand. Um, so the winner gets, what's it called? It's called an Oculus Quest, I think it is. Oculus Quest. So the winner of the Ocul Oculus Quest today is Taras Lubstjik. Taras Lub. Taras L. <laughs> Congratulations, Taras. Congratulations, Taras. Please pronounce your surname for me. Thank you very much. Taras Lubchik. There we go. Taras Lubchik, everybody. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Um, but look, guys, thank you for attending my session today. Uh, again, if you want a copy of those slides, they're available to you. Anytime you want to chat, chat anything innovation or design thinking, uh, I'd love to have a chat it out with you. Cheers. Thank you, Dean.